Hi everyone, I'm Megan Ramos from The Fasting Method and I'm here today to talk to you about intermittent fasting. So let's get started. So just a few disclosures like that I like to give before we get into the presentation is that I am the co-founder of The Fasting Method, originally called Intensive Diet intensive dietary management. We co-founded it to, I co-founded it together with my partner, Dr. Jason Fung, uh, author of the obesity code. I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. And I do want to disclose that I regain control of my health through fasting, as well as variations of low carb and ketogenic diets. So I reverse fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome. I've lost over 86 pounds now, and I will be approaching my 10th year of sustained weight loss this fall as well as reverse my type 2 diabetes. So this fall also marks my 10th anniversary of reversing my type 2 diabetes. All right, so let me give you a little bit of background of who we are. So Dr. Fung and myself, our background's actually in nephrology, which is the study of kidney disease. And many of our patients had kidney disease because of type two diabetes or obesity causing very high blood pressure levels, or so we thought at the time, um, and we were so frustrated. There is nothing really that we could do for these kidney patients. If their diabetes got worse, if they didn't lose their weight, their kidney function was gonna decline and eventually their kidneys would fail, either resulting in dialysis or kidney transplant or unfortunately death. And even for those who went on to dialysis, the life expectancy for a type two diabetic on dialysis is only three years. And for non-diabetics, it's only five years. So it was really frustrating. And I was thinking about going into a totally different career path. A lot of my family's in law. So I thought, well, if I can't actually make people get better, it's breaking my heart to watch them die. So maybe I should go into a different profession. And Dr. Fung was also feeling this frustration. You know, he became a doctor to help people and there's nothing he could do for their kidneys if their diabetes became worse. So why was type two diabetes becoming such an epidemic? So my personal health journey and what both Jason and I were going through with our own career revelations uh, sort of came to a head. And Jason had been in, reintroduced to the concept of fasting, but more from a spiritual religious perspective, which really triggered him to think about the potential therapeutic benefits of fasting around the same time as my diabetes diagnosis. And we've worked together for a long time. I actually started working with Jason when I was 15 years old. He was a young, young nephrologist fresh out of his fellowship. And I'll be 37 this year. So we've had a long standing working relationship. So obviously share a lot of resources very closely. So I was patient number one, ground zero. I started fasting and then we boomed into this large clinic in Toronto. Uh, then we moved online as well and now work with people from all over the world. So to date, we've worked with over 14,000 individuals. We started using therapeutic fasting protocols only to treat obesity and type two diabetes. But now we work with type one diabetics, latent onset type one diabetics. And the goal is to optimize their blood sugars as much as possible and to minimize the amount of insulin that they are taking. Now many type one, well type one diabetics, our classic type ones are going to need uh, insulin, but they do not need hundreds of units of insulin. We really try to work through lifestyle interventions with fasting and diet to reduce the amount of insulin they're taking. We see a lot of women at all ages for polycystic ovarian syndrome. PCOS, as it's known for short, is not exclusive to women who are in their menstruating years, who are going through the fertility journey. PCOS affects women going into menopause and postmenopausal women as well. So it's, it's truly an epidemic amongst females. And we found that fasting is a very therapeutic treatment at reducing the insulin levels within the body that helps reverse the polycystic ovarian syndrome. 
We've also had great success reversing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease through fasting. We work with cancer patients. Jason's gone on to write the cancer code. And then we also work with patients with neurological diseases like Parkinson's and MS. Now we're no longer in the clinic, we're entirely online, which makes it much more accessible to individuals around the world. So in today's presentation, I'm gonna to talk to you about the why, the physiology of fasting, how it works. And we'll talk about how you can implement fasting and go through the various intermittent protocols, the therapeutic ones, and who they work best for. And then we'll take a peek at the results. Where is the science standing? Where are we with proving that fasting is effective for both weight loss and type two diabetes reversal compared to conventional methods? So let's get started. Let's start with the why, the physiology of fasting. Well, many people say, isn't fasting just starvation? Well, no, fasting differs from starvation in very uh, critical ways. So when you're fasting, you're choosing to fast. It's voluntary. You know where food is, you could have it if you want it but you're choosing not to have it for a certain duration of time, whether it's hours or days. And these are for more health benefits or spiritual benefits, um, but you're choosing to do so. Now, in terms of starvation, when you're when you're starving, you don't know when your next meal is coming from. It's involuntary. There's nutrient deficiencies. It's a very different situation. And what hormonally happens in the body is very different as well. So what is intermittent fasting? Well, intermittent fasting involves cycling between periods of fasting and eating. So you eat and then you fast and give your body a chance to rest and burn off any excess energy from that food. And truly at its very core, intermittent fasting just allows the body to use the excess stored food energy from your meal and allows it to burn it off rather than storing it than fat. So you eat, you fuel, and then you fast and you burn the excess. And we've seen, as I noted just on the previous slide, that we started fasting for weight loss and type 2 diabetes reversal, but we've seen so many far-reaching benefits in the other metabolic conditions that I mentioned, but also in other health situations like anxiety, depression, insomnia. Fasting has far-reaching benefits when done correctly. Um, eat now, what is the problem? What are we doing in today's society that is causing issues? Well, we're always eating, right? Think of our ancestors going back now, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, they didn't have food as readily available as we do now. I mean, at all given times, we're totally surrounded by food at home, at work. And if you don't have something, now there's 50 apps on your phone where you can just click and have something to your door in half an hour or less. So we're eating all of the time and we're eating beyond satiation. We're constantly snacking and grazing throughout the day as well because life is just hectic. Who has time to sit down and have a meal, let alone prepare that meal? And food, well, food's our best friend these days. Food we've learned can help us feel better temporarily when we're stressed out. We celebrate victories with food. Uh, we go for food when we're bored and we want something to do. And we just mindlessly hang out with food. But we're constantly, constantly fueling. So what is the issue here? Well, think about you being a car and think about your body having a fuel tank. Now, your fuel tank can only store so much fuel. So maybe you can only store 40 liters of gasoline in your fuel tank or 10 gallons. I think that's the right conversion of fuel in your fuel tank. You only have limited storage capacity here. Now, uh, say there's a government mandate that, hey, you know, you must buy a complete 
full tank of fuel. So if your car is a 10 gallon or 40 liter fuel tank every day, you must buy that much fuel. Government rule, we must buy an entire fuel tank worth of fuel every single day. But think of it, the situation that we're in right now with COVID, which is why I'm seeing you online and not in person. Well, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> my bed is, you know, 30 feet from my office nowadays. Um, we're working from home. Yeah, I might drive to the, the farmer's market. I might drive to uh, non-toxic dry cleaners. But there's not that much mileage that's going on in my car. So what happens if every single day I need to fill up? Well, I'll have to eventually get a gas canister and fill up my gas canister because my fuel tank is going to be full, but I must buy that 10 gallons or 40 liters of fuel every single day. Now, this is exactly what we're doing to our bodies. Our bodies do have this mini fuel tank and a lot of it's in our liver and we call that glycogen stores. So glycogen is just glucose level or glucose from previous meals that's been not consumed in the moment of that meal and has been stored for easy access, easy fuel sources. But we only have so much glycogen storage and we're not driving our bodies very far. We're eating all the time. We eat from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed. We're constantly, constantly, constantly eating. And so it's like every day we're buying three or four or five complete tanks of fuel, but we only have one fuel tank that we're not even giving our bodies a chance to empty. So what happens when our glycogen stores get full is that the insulin starts putting that excess fuel into our fat cells. So you can actually think of these gas canisters as fat cells and all they are full of is excess fuel. So as the day goes on, as we keep eating and eating and eating, we end up with all of these canisters full of excess fuel. So our fat cells, they're topped up with excess fuel. Now, what happens over time is weight gain and disease. So we have all of this insulin pumping out, getting our, our, store, our excess fuel into our fat cells. It's a mess and it becomes this really toxic situation. So think of it, you know, at the end of the month, if you had like a hundred gas canisters that were full, they'd be filling up your car, your garage, your backyard, your balcony, maybe even your house, depending on how much space you have. And you know that's a dangerous situation to be surrounded by all of that excess gasoline. Well, this is exactly what we're doing to our body. We're overfilling it and over time it's creating this toxic situation. Now, fasting isn't new. Fasting has been practiced literally since the beginning of mankind. In fact, every single religion has some form of fasting and the fasting components to it are not just for spiritual reasons, they're actually for healing reasons. And if we even go back to 1916, over a hundred years ago, Literally, the father of type 2 diabetes, Dr. Elliot P. Jocelyn, even he acknowledges that intermittent fasting, having one day a week to fast for diabetics, is going to be how we treat type 2 diabetes. So this is not new science. And if you even go back way before that to the founding father here, Hippocrates, our food shall be our medicine and our medicine should be our food but to eat when you're sick is to feed your sickness. So fasting is not a new concept. It's not something that Dr. Fung and I just made up for in terms of treating metabolic disease, weight loss, type two diabetes. These are some of the most important figureheads in medicine talking about the health benefits of fasting. So while there are spiritual and religious properties to fasting or reasons for fasting deeply ingrained in our healthcare system, 
we've learned and we've understood the benefits of fasting. So why fast for type 2 diabetes? So many people think that it's absolutely dangerous to fast for type 2 diabetes. But type 2 diabetes is actually caused by a condition called insulin resistance, which develops when your body has toxic levels of insulin within the body. So type 2 diabetes, so many people think they're diabetic because they have too much sugar in their body. And while they have eaten foods, um, foods that are high in processed and refined sugars, that does cause the body to produce an extreme amount of insulin. And while insulin has many vital roles in the body, too much of anything that's good for you is bad for you. So these toxic levels of insulin create a condition called hyperinsulinemia, which leads to the development of insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is actually what is causing your type 2 diabetes. So we develop this insulin resistance by eating foods that are high in processed and refined carbohydrates. Now, the reason for this is because when we eat these foods, the only purpose that they serve for our body is to fuel us, unlike dietary fats and dietary proteins. Fats are the building blocks of almost every cell in the body, every hormone, and they're a fuel source. They're a fuel source that is not dependent upon insulin. And protein, if eaten and if consumed in an adequate amount, well, it's just building blocks and therefore repair. But when we eat glucose, carbohydrates, its only function is to fuel our body, and that is dependent upon insulin. We need insulin to help get the glucose into the cells. And then if our cells don't need the glucose or cannot get the glucose into the cell due to insulin resistance, then the insulin stores it as fat. So it stores the excess fuel in the canister to be used later on. So treating insulin resistance to treat type 2 diabetes, you do need to be mindful of what you eat. So for many individuals on a type two, with type 2 diabetes, you will benefit from eating a diet that's low in carbohydrates and high in healthy natural fats. So you could do a low carb diet or a ketogenic diet. And this is a therapeutic strategy that we'll use with many of our fasting patients. So the good thing about ketogenic diets is that they don't add more fuel to the fire. So if you already have a body that is full of toxic levels of insulin, you're not adding any more insulin to the system. But there's a problem here, and there's a problem that when insulin resistance becomes so advanced, often in the case of medication and insulin dependent type 2 diabetics, that low carb and ketogenic diets can't solve it alone. So when you go low carb and when you go ketogenic, yes, you're not adding more fuel to the fire via your diet, but when you develop such strong insulin resistance, that insulin resistance itself is driving up your insulin levels. So you, your body, your disease, your insulin resistance is causing your body to produce more insulin. So even though you're eating this diet that's so low in carbs or maybe is carnivore and has no carbs in it, your condition is causing your body to produce extra insulin. And if you're very insulin resistant, if your body's full of a lot of insulin, even that extra bit of insulin the insulin resistance is causing to be pumped out is detrimental. So, so many individuals come to fasting because they've tried low carb and they've tried ketogenic diets. And while they've had great success, they can't fully reach their goals. So maybe they've lost 50 of that 80 pounds, but just can't lose that last 30. Or maybe they've brought their hemoglobin A1C, that diabetes marker, from a very high level to a pre-diabetic level. And they're off their medications, but why can't they get it out of that pre-diabetic level? Why can't they get it to an optimal health level? And this is because the insulin resistance in the body is still causing insulin to be produced, which is still causing insulin resistance. And this is where fasting comes in. 
we need to stop the body from producing extra insulin. So when we fast, we force our bodies to only produce the amount of insulin that's required for daily survival that day. And we fast for these therapeutic ranges of time that I'll get to in the protocol section, we're suppressing our insulin levels low enough to sort of reset our thermos or thermostat in terms of our insulin levels within the body and we're actually able to break the cycle of insulin resistance and this is just why it's so important to fast now again not everybody with um, metabolic syndrome does need to fast. Uh, there are individuals that go to a ketogenic diet and they've got mild insulin resistance. And often when you go on a ketogenic diet, you naturally start eating less and you have these natural periods of fasting. But in more cases where the PCOS is there and it's severe, or the fatty liver is moderate in nature, or you're a medication dependent diabetic, often the diet isn't enough. And this is why you'll see myself and Dr. Fung and our other colleagues at the fasting method really working with the ketogenic and low carb communities because the power of both of these approaches will really help break the cycle of insulin resistance. So when we eat matters, it's important to get in that fasting to break the cycle. Now, many people, you know, they'll say, but uh, you know, where is, or how, isn't fasting just calorie restriction? Well, let's jump into the science of fasting a little bit here by taking a look at one of these randomized control trials. So we're so fortunate since 2016, there's actually been a lot of randomized control trials that have come out and have shown and demonstrated the results when you compare alternate daily fasting to caloric restriction. Now, in this particular study that I'm sharing from 2016, they looked at individuals over the course of 32 weeks. Now they asked these individuals not to change their diets. They were to remain on whatever diet it was that they were consuming before the study. But one group was told every other day they could consume zero calories. So they were fasting for 36 hours. The other group of individuals were instructed to reduce their caloric intake by 400 calories a day. And what were the results? Well, when we look at total fat loss, the calorie restriction group only lost 0.7% of their total fat, where the our alternate daily fasting group lost 2.4%. So that's almost three times as much fat loss. And when we look at the trunk fat loss here, the calorie restriction group only lost 0.3%. Whereas the alternate daily fasting group lost an astounding 1.8% in comparison. It's a huge difference. And then one of the biggest myths of fasting, and we're going to jump into the science of this in just a few moments, is the lean mass. So lean mass are things like our bone mass and our muscle mass. Now, anytime when you look at your body composition, if you lose body fat, your lean mass is going to go up. In the calorie restriction group, we saw it go up 0.5%. But in the alternate daily fasting group, we saw it go up 2.2%. That's over four times greater lean mass increase with alternate daily fasting. So this study goes to show, and every single randomized control trial replicated that has come out since then has demonstrated the same thing. Fasting, alternate daily fasting, doesn't result in reduction of lean mass, muscle mass, or bone mass, and everybody thinks they're going to waste away. It actually does a better job than traditional diets for increasing our lean mass. So we're not losing, and in fact, we are gaining. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, let's take a look at the resting metabolic rates. Now, one of the another big myths of fasting is that it's going to tank your metabolic rate. You're going to destroy your metabolism. Well, let's see what happened. 
Now, when we looked at the resting metabolic rate for the calorie restriction group, we saw a drop of whopping 76.1%. But with the alternate daily fasting group, we saw it go down less than half as much, 29.2% decrease. Now, when we look at any medical data, we're always looking for something called the p-value. The p-value tells us the medical clinical significance. And if the p-value is low, then there is a clinical significance there. So when we look at this, the data is showing that there's a clinically significant reduction in the resting metabolic rate of those in calorie restriction, but not of those on alternate daily fasting protocols. So if you look at their baseline versus their 32 week marker, there's not that much change in the alternate daily fasting group. Well, there is with the data shows a clinically significant reduction in the calorie restriction group. Now, why does this happen? What's the difference? Why is fasting so special? Well, when you fast, you generate these counter-regulatory hormones. So after a certain period of time when you're fasting, when your glycogen stores, we talked about that extra fuel tank in your liver and your muscles, when they become scarce, become empty or, or low, our bodies then activate our sympathetic nervous system because there's no stored fuel to go off of. Our stored fuel is becoming really low. And this activation for sympathetic nervous system causes our body to produce these counter-regulatory hormones. And this is when the fasting state is activated. So this is when fasting becomes very different than calorie restriction. It becomes a completely different physiological process than calorie restriction. This doesn't happen in calorie restriction diets. So some of these counter-regulatory hormones are adrenaline and noradrenaline, and this is what enables our body to open up our fat cells and to fuel off of our free fatty acids and ketone bodies. So fuel off of that fat that's in the fat cell. And by doing so, this is why we don't see a clinically significant reduction in our resting metabolic rate. And we also get human growth hormone production. So more on that in the next slide. And we do produce a bit of cortisol when we fast. Now it's important to remember that a little bit of stress on the body, and there's only a little bit of cortisol produced when you fast, but a little bit of stress is what helps us grow, become resilient, become successful, individuals. It's a lot of stress that you want to avoid happening, but fasting, we've never seen it be so stress inducing that it's counterproductive. And what this little bit of cortisol does is for the very few parts of our body or brain that do need glucose, the cortisol will go in the, in the liver, will enable the liver to perform a function called gluconeogenesis, which will take amino acids and convert it to glucose if the body does need glucose. So that's the role of cortisol. But let's jump to this human growth hormone. So the human growth hormone does help our body utilize fats for fuel. But when we're fasting at different increments of time, our body produces this human growth hormone and human growth hormone levels cycle when we're, we're fasting and they tend to peak around the 72 hour mark of the fast. But even within a 24 hour fast, you do get a couple of peaks of human growth hormone. Now you're not growing when you're in a fasted state, but you are producing human growth hormone in the fasted state. So when you re-enter the feeding state, your body has the perfect cocktail to help you get healthy bones, to help you develop mass. And that's what's so great about fasting is because as we get older, we don't produce human growth hormone. So our bones start to get brittle, especially with exposure to the standard North American diet and modern environmental toxins. We're at risk for osteoporosis. And as we age, we also see muscle mass decline. So how cool is it that you have this dietary tool of fasting that can actually cause these peaks, these periodic peaks of human growth hormone that can help you maintain healthy bones and maintain muscle mass. 
So when you start eating again, you have the human growth hormone from the fast, you have the amino acids from your protein source, and you are going to have some insulin being stimulated from your meal, even a low carb keto carnivore meal, you're going to have some insulin secreted, it will be very much less than the standard North American diet, but there's still going to be some insulin. And it's those three things, the growth hormone, the insulin, the amino acids, that is the perfect storm to help us grow and maintain the lean mass. So this is fantastic. You know, Jason and I and our fellow associates at the fasting method, we've seen osteoporosis be reversed. We've seen people in 76 develop, you know, rock hard biceps for the first time in their lives. It's really, really cool. And it's due to these peaks in human growth hormone that's produced. Now, I want to share a clinical example with you. So we have a female, 53 years old. She's done four days of fasting, so a 96-hour fast once a month. And then she does alternating between 16 and 24-hour fast daily. She's been doing this for two years. And twice a week, she does pretty heavy-duty weight training. And she follows a ketogenic diet and adjusts her protein accordingly to how she feels. And she's had great success with her fat loss over these years. But let's take a look at her results when it comes to lean mass. So we have this woman, she's 53 years old. She's been doing this four day extended fast an alternate daily 24 hour fast what happens so we went we sent her for what is called a dexa body composition scan now the dexa body composition scan does tell you about your bone mass composition but it also tells you about your fat mass so when we look at her results these are just a few months apart in march she had uh <coughs> she had um sorry, 126.3 pounds of lean mass. And then come July, she had 130.4 pounds of lean mass. So within the short period of time, just these few months, she had gained 1.4 pounds of lean mass. So when we look at growth hormone, it does continue to peak you know, for the first few days of fasting, but we get this periodic spikes, which really helps us preserve this lean mass. Now let's jump into how to fast. So what are intermittent fasting protocols? So I'm just going to run through them quickly here, and then we'll do a deeper dive into each protocol. So we have the standard 16 or 18 hour fast, which you'll commonly hear on social media and in the news is the 16-8 or the 18-6 diet. And then we get into more of these therapeutic ranges of fasting, 24, 36, and 42 hours of fasting. Now, in terms of how often people do these fasts, if someone is in more maintenance mode, they'll do a 16 or 18 hour fast daily. But if you're really looking for therapeutic benefits of fasting, we do more of the 26, 30, uh, 24, 36, and 42 hour fasting pro protocols three times a week. So the 16-8 or the 18-6 fast. Now when we're working with an insulin resistant individual, we actually have them do this much fasting every eating day. So a 16 or 18 hour fast in our community is considered to be an eating day. So every eating day, they're often skipping breakfast. But in a 16 or 18 hour fast, you're just skipping one meal that day and eating two consecutive meals. So more often than not, people will skip breakfast and have lunch and dinner, or alternatively, some populations prefer to have breakfast and lunch and then skip dinner. So there's um, different lifestyle factors and different cultural factors that will dictate which one of these protocols makes up your 16 or 18 hour fast. Um, but typically here in North America, we have more individuals skip breakfast and just have lunch and dinner. So for some people, this is a, a fasting day for them. For insulin resistant individuals, we consider this to be a well-structured eating day. So if you are a healthy individual or you've regained your health through fasting, low carb, keto, some combination thereof, and you wanna maintain that good health, 
doing this fast daily is for you. Now, the 24 hour fast, it means you're skipping two consecutive meals and three days a week. So this is where we typically would start someone who is got more mo uh, mild to moderate insulin resistance. Maybe they have prediabetes or borderline diabetes. Maybe they're on metformin. They're struggling to lose more than 20 or 30 pounds. So we would have them do the 24 hour fasting protocol. So an example of this would be say, fasting from dinner on Sunday to dinner on Monday. So you would skip breakfast and lunch on Monday. So three times a week, you would skip two consecutive meals, fasting from dinner the night before to dinner that particular day. And this is, you're still having that one meal on your fasting day, but it's 24 hours after your last meal. So every day you are eating while doing the 24 hour fasting protocol. Now the 36 hour fasting protocol is what we try to get individuals with more moderate to severe insulin resistance. So those with long standing history of diabetes, maybe they're on medications, maybe they're on insulin, um, women with PCOS, um, more fatty liver disease. This is sort of our gold therapeutic standard range or where we get started with it or gold standard. So 36 hours, I know the math of that all sounds kind of weird, but it's actually quite clean when you look at it on a table. So you would fast for one day and eat for one day, fast for one day, eat for one day, fast for one day, eat for one day. So on your eating days, you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and on your fasting days, you just fast. So again, this is what we would drive more insulin resistant individuals or those looking to lose more than 20 or 30 pounds. Now the 42 hour fasting protocol is often something people really just in, prefer to do. It's exactly like the 36 with the exception that you, breakfast is no longer in your vocabulary. You just never have it. So you have day one, you fast, day two, you eat lunch and dinner. Day three, you fast. Day four, you eat lunch and dinner. So you never have breakfast and your eating days are lunch and dinner and your fasting days are total fasting days. And this is what most people choose to do. And this is where we really, again, insulin resistance. This is actually one of the couple of fasting protocols that work best for women, especially postmenopausal women looking to lose weight. Oh, sorry, my screen jumped there. All right and extended fasting protocols here. So extended fasting protocols would be doing a 48 hour fast twice a week. Now this is a hugely popular fasting protocol and I'd have to say in our community is the most popular fasting protocol right now. The reason why is two fasts per week instead of three fasts per week. So if you're doing the 36 or 42 hour fast, you're missing dinner time three times a week. Now in pre-COVID days, this isn't that problematic, but in COVID days when everyone's at home, that evening meal time where you come together as a family, especially when you're working from home, that's become really important to a lot of individuals. So we've actually been transferring people from doing two or three 42 hour fasts a week to two 48 hour fasts a week because it's less impactful in their family situation. But it's also just as effective in terms of fat loss and insulin resistance. Now, when you do three 42 hour fasts a week, you are doing more total fasting per week. But many of us with insulin resistance really struggle to get into fat loss and see those insulin levels come down until we're approaching that 24 hour mark. So when you're actually doing the 48 hour fast, you're getting in an additional six hours of deeper fat burning than you are with the 42 hour fast or a deeper state of ketosis. So I find the results to be quite comparable, whether you're doing three 42s or two 48s, because when you do two 48s, that's a total of 12 extra hours in a deeper fast state or deeper state of ketosis. Other popular extended fasting protocols are the 66 and the 
plus a 48 or a 42. Uh, you can really mix it up here. Many individuals, especially women, will do a 72 hour fast once a week. Often they'll combine that with a 24, but this is a very popular protocol for women. Um, then we'll occasionally get insulin resistant individuals to commit to doing a monthly extended fast of perhaps five days. And occasionally there are individuals that are looking to do longer fasts. So maybe once a year annually or quarterly, you can do an extended fast of seven days or so. And this is good for hormonal reset, clean up. So there are some good benefits of doing these occasional extended fasts. Now, what can you have when you're fasting? So with the fasting method, if you're fasting for insulin related conditions, type two diabetes, polycystic ovarian syndrome, fatty liver disease, weight loss. You can of course have water. Uh, <laughs> you can get really wild with water. It can be room temperature, it can be cold, it can be hot, um, but you can have mineral and carbonated water as well. We're big proponents of magnesium. It's one of the very few supplements that we encourage people to have on their fasting days. I'm a big fan of the Keto Chow's magnesium drops. They're a great way to get in magnesium that's very well absorbed and doesn't cause gastric distress like so many over-the-counter magnesium supplements. But magnesium supplementation can help you manage any sleep disturbances that you might get when you're brand new to fasting. It can also help calm any jitters. Sometimes when we produce all that noradrenaline, those counter-regulatory hormone, when we're fasting, we can feel a little bit jittery or anxious and the magnesium helps with that. And then salt, I'm a big fan of getting in sodium when you're fasting. I could actually do a whole day seminar on salt. Um, keto chow fasting drops are a good salt alternative as well. They're salty, very concentrated salty water, uh, maybe. <laughs> Um, uh, is a good way of explaining it, but getting in salt on your fasting day is so important. There's all different types of strategies for doing that. You can have tea, you can have bone broth, and you can have coffee. It's important to keep in mind with coffee that there are percentages of the population that metabolize caffeine very, very slowly. Um, and there's also percentages of the population that uh, sees a glucose response to consuming caffeine. And even individuals who are sensitive to caffeine often are still sensitive to the little bit of caffeine in decaffeinated coffee. So you need to be mindful of hunger signals and blood sugar cues after consuming your coffee to know if it's wise for you. Otherwise, you could go to a green tea, which is lower in caffeine, or a herbal tea like mint tea. That's a great appetite suppressant, but is caffeine free. Now, if you're canceling or fasting for cancer, or neurological conditions or disease um, prevention, you really want to keep your fast to so just water and salt. And then, of course, magnesium. Now, with magnesium on fasting for these intentions for cancer, especially, I do like the Kira Chow magnesium drops or Epsom salt baths, but I would tend to stay away from oral supplementation in other forms. Now, let's take a look at some of the results, especially when it comes to type 2 diabetes. Now, in describing how counter-regulatory hormones worked, we talked about some of the fat loss results that we're seeing in the medical literature. But what is there in terms of support for type 2 diabetes? And I will tell you, getting research ethics board approval to fast type 2 diabetics, given the current standard of care of type 2 diabetic patients in North America, is a nightmare. So myself, Dr. Fong, so many of our great low-carb and keto doctor fans in North America who use fasting on their patients, we're eagerly and desperately trying to get case reports and case series published to warrant further investigation. So if you want to get a big medical study done, you need to have these case reports and case studies that make having a big study more valid or support the cause. So this is one of the 
few case reports and case series Dr. Fung and I have published. We've been so fortunate to get them in a journal like BMJ Case Reports, which is a, a very um, prestigious and a good, uh, has a great reputation. So in this particular case series, Jason and I looked at three of our patients, male patients ranging in ages from 40 to 67. They had type two diabetes ranging from 10 to 25 years. And they had the trifecta of issues. They had the high blood pressure, the high cholesterol, the kidney disease, secondary to their type 2 diabetes. So we put them on alternate daily fasts. They fasted three times a week, most often Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And they did a minimum of 24 and a maximum of 42 hours in this particular situation. And these were the results. Well, within, if you look at the furthest column here on the right, within <laughs> three weeks, all three patients were off insulin. In fact, one individual who had been diabetic for 20 years, well, he was off insulin in just five days. So it is just so amazing. And they also dropped some of their oral diabetic medications. We saw reductions here in their hemoglobin A1C. Their hemoglobin A1C levels were all better at the end off insulin than they were on insulin and oral diabetic medications. We saw substantial fat loss. We saw a significant reduction in waist circumference as well. So huge, this is just huge because we've shown that intermittent fasting can control blood sugar levels better than the diabetic medications. Now, I know we're at Keto Salt Lake. I'm so sorry we're not here in person. I've actually been so looking forward to going to Salt Lake City. It's one of the very few places I haven't been yet. So we'll have to catch you there in 2022. But uh, we are big proponents of the ketogenic diet for individuals who are battling insulin resistance. So when you eat, how often you eat, is important. It is just as important as eating a nutrient dense diet. Now this is going to vary. Um, we support all diets, the fasting method, we're not agnostic, um, but real food diets that really prioritize healthy natural fats, everything from individuals who are more plant based like a pescatarian to individuals that are carnivore, you can do the diets very well across the spectrum. And it's really important to eat these real whole foods, these unprocessed, unrefined, unpredigested <laughs> food types, and eat the specific diet, whether it's more animal or more plant, whatever one works best for your physiology. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining me here today. If you're interested in learning more about fasting, you can head over to thefastingmethod.com. We have tons and tons of free resources. There's thousands of blog posts that are free. There's tons of vlogs uh, on all of this insulin and fasting stuff. So head over, check it out. And I look forward to seeing you soon and hopefully in person, everyone. So have a great day. Bye for now.